gold trails and ghost towns with Mike Roberts and Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, our tour guide for the uh, Pacific Northwest, British Columbia, Northern United States. Usually we go to places, and uh, today though we're going to do something a little different. We're going to a thing today. Well, Mike, we're going to the Silvery Slocan, which is an area in the West Kootenai country, and we're going to, I, I think the greatest line, and it's debatable, but I think one of the greatest lines in the Northwest, no doubt about it, the old Caslow and Slocan. Greatest little railway line. Greatest railroad line started in 1895, ran for about 20 years, and it made a mark uh, on the Northwest, partly because of its history, partly because of the, of the country it built through. Fascinating line. Okay, so we're going to, we, we've done the Kettle Valley before, so now we're going to another railway line, the KNS, Caslow and Slocan, and we'll do that right after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns, talking about the uh, Caslow and Slocan Railway, but maybe a good idea just to take people to that scene again, because uh, to know what the dynamics of the location are is to understand, I guess, about the KNS. What's Caslow, first well, of all? Well, Caslow is the big town in the West Kootenai in 1893. It's even bigger than Nelson, and uh, it's bigger than Rosslyn, and here, here's, here's an early 1890 shot of Caslow, Main Street, Caslow, and as you can see, teeming with people. The boardwalks are there, the buildings are new, Caslow is going to be the capital of the West Kootenai country. And this is why. And this is why. This is why. And there he is. J.W. Cockle, interesting character. He was the guy who started the rush because he wanders through the bush. We alluded to this one in one other program. He discovers a, what looked like a solid silver boulder weighing 120 tons. And the word flashes down the coast of the United States that they're discovering boulders in the silvery slow can that weigh, and they're solid silver and they weigh over 100 tons. Well, the stampede started. <laughs> Look at this. This is a great <laughs> shot. This, I swear this was San Francisco, but oh, it isn't. Oh, you would. Probably San in 1896. Sandon. Sandon for sure. This is the other key to the Silvery Slow Can. So there's Caslow on Kootenai Lake, and you okay. go inland over the Slow Can Range and drop down just a little bit into Sandon, and it's, 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 uh, it's the Silver City of the Slow Can, and that was the original name. Bonafide City, several thousand people, 24 saloons jammed <laughs> to the rafters with people and promoters and miners and prospectors, all willing to get on the ground floor of the mining boom. And into this, of course, who wants to be part of the mining boom more than anybody else? Railways. Well, sure. Now, there are two things going here. First of all, Caslow wants to be the big town. And their businessmen are very ambitious, guys like Green and Kane and all the rest of them. And they decide they're going to build a railroad. So they raise a considerable sum of money, many thousands of dollars. And they, they interest the Great Northern. They, they interest it. And the Great Northern is, is, is somehow gets allied, but they don't own the railway yet. That happens about 1900. But on the, on the east side, so on the other side of the Slocan, on Slocan Lake, the CPR sees this. They're on the west side. Now, excuse me, on the west side, yeah. right. They're on the west side. So the CPR and the Great Northern have no love for each other. And James J. Hill has a deep abiding hatred of Van Horn. So James Hill gets allied, but they don't own the railway yet. That happens about 1900. But on the, on the what happens is they start from Caslow, and they start building in 1894, and they start building up through that country, and that country, Mike, is just absolutely unbelievable. It goes up and down, and people who've been through that country can't believe where that railroad came through. Mm -hmm. It's past sheer precipices. It was just a magnificent building job. Okay. The other amazing thing is, and here's a, a steamboat, this railway didn't connect up the one that James Dale Hill starting didn't connect up with any other railway. It was a railway in the wilderness. That's right. It's a 30 mile, a 30 mile stretch of line, and that's all there is to it. And this is the first stern wheeler on on Kootenai Lake, and this is the Nelson. And what actually happened? It brought in the locomotives piece by piece. And this on the front cover of your Canada West magazine for the fall of 1971 is a shot of a locomotive. So this is what that boat would have had to bring in. This one and every other piece yeah, of the railway. Yeah, the boiler equipment. and the stack and 
all the rest of it piece by piece and unloading it. Terrific job cursing and swearing teamsters as they, as they tried to get this thing unloaded off the boat. And uh, a real job, a real job. This was a bald one. It was a workhorse of a locomotive. Marvelous piece of machinery. And so they brought in every one of these. And this next shot we've got is of uh, uh, some of the other rolling stock because not only did you have to bring in the locomotive and every other thing, but every other piece of stock sure. you had going. Two passenger cars and 20 freight cars for carrying the ore. Now this is, as they worked west, the, the, the line was built. It's built in 1895, it's completed. And as we go up the line, we go past Nash and we get into Whitewater. This is Whitewater. Another shot of Whitewater, Mike, and rather interesting because at the extreme right-hand side, everybody's posing for the picture, but behind them is the sacked silver ore, ready to go. And this would be very, very high grade because it's all sacked. Now Whitewater, that's, it's a, each one of these spots is a mine, a well, separate mine. Probably. Yes, except for Nashton. Whitewater, the Whitewater Deep and the Whitewater and the Gladstone, a whole bunch of mines up there, some of them running in the initial, in the initial uh, driving of, of, of some of their tunnels, 500, 600 ounces in the ton. Not as rich as salmon, but very rich ore indeed. Certainly worth pausing by and, and excavating. And lots of it, too. <laughs> lots of that. Next shot is of, a, of another little community on there. This one, I love this name. Give me the, it rattles off your tongue. So well, McGeegan. McGeegan and who else? Well, McGeegan, you see, is a famous name in, 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 in this particular country because he was one of the original Noble Five. There was a Noble Five mine, Mike, yeah. and the Noble Five was named after five Irishmen, Jack Seaton and Hennessy, Hennessy, McGeegan, and Flint. This is McGeegan. Let's see that shot again because this is a great uh, photograph. It tells you two things. A, the guy that took this photograph had to take it before 1910 because we'll tell you the story later. Yeah. And uh, so this is the trestle that they built into McGeegan and the mines in the area. Well, yeah, the trestle is really quite a magnificent structure. And so we know this is prior to 1910 because that trestle went in the 1910 fire. And it was another stopping place. They picked up ore here, so they picked up ore at Whitewater, picked up ore at McGeegan. And, you know, and so it was, it was going to be a paying thing as far as they were concerned. Yeah. You already alluded to the fact that this country was straight up and down. And at the opening of this show, we have a great shot, and this oh, is yeah. it. Uh, what's what's the this location? Well, this is 21 miles out of out of out of Caslow, and you can see the sign there. It says 21. That's mile 21. And this is one of the great shots of the West, and we do use it in our opening, and, and rightfully so, because this shows what railroading in the 1890s was all about. And boy, these guys do they like that railroad? The Here it is, a narrow gauge. Sure. Right on the edge, this guy's standing. Sure, and he's looking down just over a thousand feet. It's a thousand and eighty feet. I know I've been up there and when they built that line, Mike, they had to anchor ring bolts into the rocks and just and, and actually use cables to keep that line in place. It was it was an incredible building. And that place um, is called Payne Bluff. That's, that's Payne Bluff. Yeah. Okay. Around Parapet. Well that's Parapet leading up to Payne Bluff. Okay? Great names, eh? Oh yeah. Wonderful name. And of course, they're all heading to the Mecca. Well, here the, they are. Here they are in the little station house in Sandon. And this is the K and S station in Santa. In fact, I had that building and owned it, Mike, for one time. And, and, and unfortunately, I put a roof on it several thousand dollars about 20 years ago, and it was burned down, which is a real, it's a shame. So the old station house is no longer there. Not only is the line gone, but so is the station house. So the location, it started, they started building in Caslow. Started building in Caslow, 1895. Within a year, they're in Sandon. They have reached it. They have driven a line 30 miles. So they go up from they go up from Caslow and they go through a little place called Nashton, also known as Zwicky, named after a guy called Zwicky, and right up to Whitewater or Retallick. That yep. was the second name because John Retallick was a big mining promoter and a mine manager there. So they also called it Retallick after him. What Past, was it just the, the club who was referring to it? We refer to it as either Whitewater or as st still known by both names. Mm -hmm. Strangely. Then it went past Bear Lake City, which really never was a city. Yeah. And then it goes up a, just past Zinkton, and then past Parapet, into McGeegan, past Payne Bluff, and into Sandon. And that is the line. And of course, they, they felt, James J. Hill, when he was controlling this line by 1900, felt that this might indeed be another Comstock load. As big as, what, Denver? I, I well, yeah, that's Colorado right, all, the, all that silver in, in, in the Nevadas. So essentially, he, he was gambling. He was gambling. So was the CPR. They were driving, arrived in Sandon almost the same time. That's so right. the CPR coming in from the cusp and the K&S coming in from, from Caslow and both vying for the lion's share of, of the ore. Yeah. So they traveled this 30 miles, got the whole thing built in one year. Yep. Got in one year. Uh, this is, I, I've referred to this, I think when we were talking about the, uh, the Kettle Valley line when we did that story, 
I was amazed at the surveyor. This is, what do you call this collection? Well, of it's a surveyor's chain is what it is. And each individual little piece of, of this, it's all made out of metal for a yeah. very good reason. It doesn't yeah. stretch, I guess. That's right. And they measure by rods instead of inches and feet. And so That's this, brass and steel. Very well made, Mike. And this is the, this is, was dragged and carried every stick of the way yeah. as they put in that engineer. Sure, by the chain man, yep. Just an amazing task. Oh, yeah. One year. Yes. Yeah. All right. Once you get the line built, then you begin to go. I, look at this is the proudest piece of locomotive <laughs> you've ever seen. And partly because it's engine number one. This is the first bald one to come in on the line. And you'll see they didn't feed it with coal because there was no coal in that particular part of the West Kootenai country. So they had to give it, it was wood fed and uh, really a marvelous piece of machinery. Yeah, it's what, four driving wheels, and it really carried the freight. These guys, tell me about these. These well, may not even be railroaders. <laughs> I don't think they are, Mike. First of all, they're pretty young to be railroaders. Secondly, the railroaders often wore a bowler hat. And, but what it, what it really probably is a stage shot in a studio, and uh, these are probably props, including the gloves and everything there. And every boy's dream in the 1890s, like today, Today it's a jet pilot. In those days, it was the engineer of a train. Yeah. That, was, that was their dream. And in those days, it was a thrill to not only own a railroad, but to ride on it, I guess. And these, these people not only participated in the owning of it, but this ticket. I mean, most people just throw tickets away. So the fact that you have a ticket on the Caslow and Slocan is an amazing thing. It, and this, this top ticket would give you the railroad, I guess. That's right, came from Sandon. And this one would take you on the boat to Nelson. And that's right, the stern wheeler to Nelson. And this is the only known ticket of the Caslow and Slocan Railway surviving. I got it off old Mrs. John Morgan Harris, whose husband really was the king of Sandon, a guy called John, John Morgan Harris. I should have been wearing my cotton gloves for oh, this yes. one. This other thing, I, I, I just love what you're able to come up with. We've marked the place here, just trust me, we have. This is the uh, register for uh, the hotel good enough. I know it up here, but really not necessarily. No, right? no, it wasn't. It, it, it was originally for the hotel good enough, but yeah. John Morgan Harris took it over, and then he used this because he didn't waste a penny. Yeah. And he used it, and actually it was for the Rico Hotel. So the Rico, and the interesting thing about this particular page we've chosen out of here, yeah. it have the hundreds of pages in it, is that there are eight individuals who have come in from Caslow. They've taken the train all the way from Caslow through 30 miles of mountainous territory to go to a, to go to a bond spiel in, in, in Sandon. It says right, Caslow Curling Club sure. is paying their way, I guess, eh? And that's well, who's getting the bill? Probably, and there are two rinks there. And some of those names, such as Green and Jardine, yeah, they're Green. still in Caslow. So, so these are, these are relatives of people who were in, in Caslow at that time, and they're still there. And arrived there Saturday, February the 11th, 1905. And there's another interesting name, Mike. If you look down below that list, you'll see a name called W. Yawkey, Y-A-W-K-E-Y. Uh -huh. From now, Detroit. That's right. But the interesting thing is he had a mine in, in the Sandon area, a very rich silver mine, and through the proceeds of that and the profits and the dividends from this mine, he was able to buy the Boston Red Sox which is an American League team, and kept it for many years in the family. It, you know, it's, isn't that wonderful? Because out of this little area that hardly any British Columbians have gone to, mm -hmm. it attracted everybody. Didn't I hear that uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually came here and got kicked out of the way by... Well, that was, that was in the same country. It was in the same part of the West Coast, yeah. but that was down in the Ainsworth yeah. area. And but Ainsworth. everybody was coming here because of the wealth of it. Oh, yeah. They, they, they felt it would never end. Some of, some of those mines were so rich, it was 50 feet of ore between the walls. Yeah. The first year, I, the fact that they built this thing in one year, but then the fact that in the first year it did so well. What, what did it carry out of this? Now tell me, before you go anywhere, there were how many people in Caslow? 1,500? No, there were more than that then. Probably in 96 there would be about 2,500 people. Yeah. Probably about 2,000 in Sandon. So, so you have 4,500 people, another 500 in, in Whitewater and 100 in Ashton. So only a population of 6,000. But the interesting thing is that first year this train carried 23,000 tons of freight which is a heck of a lot. It carried over 28,000 passengers <laughs> and ran over 32,000 miles. So it made more than one trip per day, round trip, because round trip is only 60 miles. So it averaged more than one round trip. Some days they were making two trips into Sandon. That's astronomical. 28,000 passengers, yeah. 23,000 tons of freight, yeah, and, and 32,000 32, miles. miles. That's rounded off. 
So James J. Hill's idea of building a little 30-mile uh, shunter line was a, was a good idea. Did he make any money in that first year? No. They made a lot of money. In the first year, in 1896, they made $66,000. Other years, they made up to $90,000. But what happened was this, Mike. Something did happen. And James J. Hill was very quick to react to it. They built a smelter in Trail, and they, and they built a smelter. Actually, the smelter was built in Trail in 96. And, but by 1900, it was starting to move along. And there was another smelter in Nelson. And, uh, and instead, now the shippers were looking very carefully at costs, because previously they had preferred the K&S. They didn't like the CPR too much. So they shipped by the K&S. So the, the, the ore would go to Caslo, trans-shipped on a stern wheeler, and away down to Montana. But now as the ore got deeper and got a little thinner and not as rich, they had to look at another alternative. The other alternative was the CPR. So it began to grab more and more of the lion's share of the, of the ore coming out of sand and in places like Three Forks and the Alamo and all those places. So that James J. Hill began to pull away from the, from the K&S and it, the load fell back on the businessmen of Caslow. The Another fascinating thing, a benchmark for all of this would be to just pick up your community newspaper. Sure. And this, this paper here is the Kootenayan. And the Kootenayan yeah. uh, was published what, out of Caslow? Ca published out of Caslow, you know, originally uh, uh, Lowry, uh, he, he established the old Caslow claim and then, yeah. then he came back and, and sold the claim and it became the Kootenayan. And the Kootenayan really tracks the, the fortunes of Caslow. And if you look at this very, very closely, Mike, you'll see a couple of things that are rather disturbing. And the year is 1907. The K&S, the railway line is starting to slip. And if you look over on the right-hand side, mineral you'll see claims. that mineral claims for sale, only about a dozen of them are picked up. But dozens and dozens, they don't even bother. Yeah. And also, uh, as I perused this, this paper some time ago, you'll find in the little bottom part of it that a businessman in Caslow offers to bet the editor of the paper $50 cash that Caslow will become the town in the West Kootenai A businessman bets the publisher of this paper That's right. that Caslow will be. Will be the town. That means the biggest town in the yeah. West Kootenai in five years. This is 1907. And both Trail Rosslyn, uh, Trail Rosslyn and Nelson are all a lot bigger. The publisher doesn't take the bet, and he's right. He could see the writing in his own newspaper. Sure the writing could. was on the wall. Sure he could. And that was 1907. Yeah. And so they began encountering all sorts of difficulties, and this is one of the difficulties. They have wrecks. Here's, here's one of the ore trains going over, and I think it's just probably to the west of Zinkton, but it may be to the east of Whitewater. There's a similarity mm -hmm. between that country, and it's hard to compare the backgrounds. And that, interesting enough, is, is spilling silver ore, and they didn't bother to go down there and shovel it up. They just kept, went back and got another load. So you had a great difficulties. You had uh, a country that snowed for about six months in the year and snowed heavily, so you had avalanches, you had snow slides, you had clearing of snow, you had big trestles and always the repairs on the trestles. So they were starting to mount up. As the silver slowed down, the expenses mounted up, and the Caslow and Slocan began to become a very, very questionable operation indeed. Yeah. And this shot, the word fire is a four-letter word when it comes to all of the history of southern BC. This shot spells the end of the Caslow and Slocan Railway, because in 1910, uh, a horrendous, massive fire, forest fire, swept through all that part of the Slocan district, wiped out not only the town of Whitewater, which we just looked at, that's what remained of Whitewater, killed five or six miners and, and mine owners. He just couldn't get out of the way fast enough. Yeah. They knew it was coming and couldn't get out of the way fast enough because it was crowning. And not only that, it destroyed most of the trestles of the mm -hmm. K&S, and it twisted the rails and wiped out most of the stations. So by 1910, the KNS is essentially finished. Staggering. What and a whirlwind. It's a whirlwind activity filled with people willing to take the chance. Uh, a staggering kind of an idea. Yeah, and what happened was this. With the, with the, with the downfall of the KNS, really it's the end of Caslow as a significant town. And if you look at the early atlases, Caslow was fourth or fifth largest city in British Columbia in 93. Probably fifth if you go by the directories as well. Mm -hmm. And now it starts to lapse into kind of the backwaters. And it never did regain its form and a prominence and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the mining world. I think a lot of people have driven through that country and stopped at Caslow. There are still things to see in the Silvery Slocan, and we've got some stories about that when we come back from this break.
Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley. I, I feel I've been over the uh, Caslow and Slocan Railway today. Well, Mike, you should go over. I was just back, so yeah. I took a number of shots, and these are just three selected shots. City Hall of Caslow, 1898, built then, still going strong almost 100 years later, and looks marvelous, as do many buildings in Caslow. And you go up the line along the old K&S right away, you see one of the old cabins still left at Nashton, one of three or four buildings there. And then you continue along and you come across one of the ore bins hard by the highway. And the highway, of course, in that particular case is the roadbed of the old K&S. And you go through that country, fascinating what you'll find. Here's a beautiful little souvenir. This is to J.B. from E.W. Now, when does this, what does this date back to? When did you find this? Dates back to the 1890s, found in the 1950s. And given by a man to a woman, naturally, because this is what a woman wore. It's a match safe, it's washed in gold, it's sterling silver, silver chain hung around her neck, and kept matches there. She obviously smoked, so perhaps in that day, she was a woman of questionable reputation. Hard to tell. Oh, you know this all from the fact she carries matches, mm -hmm. eh? Remarkable. There is a story. Uh, of, of treasure associated with sand and not the railway necessarily. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, there are a number of stories associated with sand, and three of them actually, but one of them is still there. And when the, when the flood in Sandon happened in 1955, the main street was really built over Carpenter Creek. And it took out all that main street, virtually all of it, and most, and most of the boardwalk. But there was one section of boardwalk that was left. So I, I managed to pick up about 100 coins in that section of the boardwalk and measure it off. And then yeah, I equated it with the, the, with the remaining boardwalk that had been there prior to the 1955 flood. And there were about 10,000 coins somewhere down Carpenter Creek. And the interesting, only 41 of them have actually been found. A guy from Toronto was in there about 15 years ago, and he, was, he had known of, uh, of the background of this story and was wandering down the creek, came across an old tobacco tin with a rusted lid on it. Shook it, rattled, opened it up, managed to knock the lid off, 41 old silver dollars in the, in the tin. So that's the only major discovery of the entire 10,000 coins. Some of those would be gold coins, some would be tokens, some would be silver coins. Yeah. And, but perhaps they're better left to the archaeologists of the future who will probably uh, resurrect some of the, the history of this old town, which really hasn't been done. You got it. What's the specific density of a, of a coin of any sort? I mean, is it going to drop down, given the velocity of the flood at the time, is it going to be a mile downstream? Or? No, gold would be almost certainly go to bedrock, and we yeah. don't know how deep bedrock is there. And silver's half the weight of gold, approximately, so it wouldn't go very far. It tends to skate a little bit. So silver, they would be near the surface. Gold would certainly be down. Carpenter Creek. And, I mean, there's still mining activity going on near the Sandon area. There's sure. still lots of activity in that country. Mining the old Ruth Hope property, and a lot of people feel there's ample room for other new mines, which will be discovered in the future in that country. For sure, Mike. What an amazing story. Oh, yeah. James J. Hill decides that he's going to take the CPR on, and it makes it work for him for the better part of 20 years. Well, he really made it work for him for five years, and the line itself worked for another 15 after that, but he got, the, he got, a, he got out very, very well indeed. The usual luck of James J. Hill. Sounds like the typical good businessman. That's our Gold Trail story for tonight. Join us next time for another story. Bye-bye.